but I might perhaps make a better use of the opening you afforded me if I were to direct your mind to a loftier theme than that of art. It would appear to be unseasonable to go in search of a code for the aesthetic world when the moral world offers matter of so much higher interest and when the spirit of philosophical inquiry is so stringently challenged by the circumstances of our times to occupy itself with the most perfect of all works of art, the establishment and the structure of a true political freedom. It is unsatisfactory to live out of your own age and to work for other times. It is equally incumbent on us to be good members of our own age as of our own state or country. If it is conceived to be unseemly or even unlawful for a man to segregate himself from the customs and manners of the circle in which he lives, it would be inconsistent not to see that it is equally his duty to grant a proper share of influence to the voice of his own epoch, to his taste and its requirements in the operations in which he engages. But the voice of our age seems by no means favorable to art at all events for that kind of art to which my inquiry is directed. The course of events has given a direction to the genius of the time that threatens to remove it continually further from the ideal of art. For art has to leave reality, it has to raise itself boldly above necessity and neediness. For art is the daughter of freedom, and it requires its prescriptions and rules to be furnished by the necessity of spirits and not by that of matter. But in our day, it is necessity, neediness, that prevails and lends a degraded humanity under its iron yoke. Utility is a great idol of the time, to which all powers do homage, and all subjects are subservient. In this great balance on utility, the spiritual service of art has no weight, and deprived of all encouragement, it vanishes from the noisy vanity fair of our time. The very spirit of philosophical inquiry itself robs the imagination of one promise after another, and the frontiers of art are narrowed in proportion as the limits of science are enlarged. The eyes of the philosopher, as well as of the man of the world, are anxiously turned to the theater of political events, where it is presumed the great destiny of man is to be played out. It would almost seem to betray a culpable indifference to the welfare of society if we do not share this general interest. For this great commerce in social and moral principles is of necessity a matter of the greatest concern to every human being, on the ground both of its subject and of its results. It must accordingly be of deepest moment to every man to think for himself. It would seem that now at length a question that formerly was only settled by the law of the stronger is to be determined by the calm judgment of the reason. And every man who is capable of placing himself in a central position and raising his individuality into that of his species may look upon himself as in possession of this judicial faculty of reason, being, moreover, as man and member of the human family, a party in the case under trial, and involved more or less in its decisions. It would thus appear that this great political process is not only engaged with his individual case, it has also to pronounce enactments which he, as a rational spirit, is capable of enunciating and entitled to pronounce. It is evident that it would have been most attractive to me to inquire into an object such as this, to decide a question in conjunction with the thinker of a powerful mind, a man of liberal sympathies, and a heart imbued with a noble enthusiasm for the weal of humanity, though so widely separated by a worldly position, it would have been a delightful surprise to have found your unprejudiced mind 
arriving at the same result as my own in the field of ideas. Nevertheless, I think I can not only excuse, but even justify, by solid grounds, my step in resisting this attractive purpose and preferring beauty to freedom. I hope that I shall succeed in convincing you that this matter of art is less foreign to the needs than to the tastes of our age. Nay, that to arrive at a solution, even in the political problem, the road of aesthetics must be pursued, because it is through beauty that we arrive at freedom. But I cannot carry out this proof without my bringing to your remembrance the principles by which the reason is guided in political legislation. Man is not better treated by nature in his first start than her other works are, so long as he is unable to act for himself as an independent intelligence. She acts for him, but the very fact that constitutes him a man is that he does not remain stationary where nature has placed him, but he can pass with his reason, retracing the steps nature had made him anticipate that he can convert the work of necessity into one of free solution and elevate physical necessity into a moral law. When man is raised from his slumber in his senses, he feels that he is a man. He surveys his surroundings and finds that he is in a state. He was introduced into this state by the power of circumstances before he could really select his own position. But as a moral being, he cannot possibly rest satisfied with the political condition forced upon him by necessity and only calculated for that condition. And it would be unfortunate if this did satisfy him. In many cases, Man shakes off this blind law of necessity by his free, spontaneous action, of which, among many others, we have an instance in his ennobling by beauty and suppressing by moral influence the powerful impulse implanted in him by nature in the passion of love. Thus, when arrived at maturity, he recovers his childhood by an artificial process. He founds a state of nature in his ideas, not given him by any experience, but established by the necessary laws and conditions of his reason. And he attributes to this ideal condition an object and aim of which he was not cognizant in the actual reality of nature. He gives himself a choice of which he was not capable before, and says to work just as if he were beginning anew and were exchanging his original state of bondage for one of complete independence, doing this with complete insight and of his free decision. He is justified in regarding this work of political thraldom as non-existing, though a wild and arbitrary caprice may have founded its work very artfully, though it may strive to maintain it with great arrogance and encompass it with a halo of veneration. For the work of blind powers possesses no authority before which freedom need bow, and all must be made to adapt itself to the highest end which reason has set up in its personality. It is in this wise that a people in a state of manhood is justified in exchanging a condition of thraldom for one of moral freedom. Now the term natural condition can be applied to every political body which owes its establishment originally to forces and not to laws. And such a state contradicts the moral nature of man, because lawfulness can alone have authority over this. At the same time, this natural condition is quite sufficient for the physical man, who only gives himself laws in order to get rid of brute force. Moreover, the physical man is a reality, and the moral man problematical. Therefore, when the reason suppresses the natural condition, as she must, if she wishes to substitute her own, she weighs the real physical man against the problematical moral man. Therefore, 
when the reason suppresses the natural condition, as she must if she wishes to substitute her own. She weighs the real physical man against the problematical moral man. She weighs the existence of society against the possible, though morally necessary, ideal of society. She takes from man something which he really possesses and without which he possesses nothing, and refers him as a substitute to something that he ought to possess and might possess, and if reason had relied too exclusively on him, she might, in order to secure him a state of humanity in which he is wanting and can want without injury to his life, have robbed him even of the means of animal existence, which is the first necessary condition of his being a man. Before he had opportunity to hold firm to the law with his will, reason would have withdrawn from his feet the ladder of nature. The great point is, therefore, to reconcile these two considerations, to prevent physical society from ceasing for a moment in time while the moral society is being formed in the idea. In other words, to prevent its existence from being placed in jeopardy for the sake of the moral dignity of man. When the mechanic has to mend a watch, he lets the wheels run out. But the living watchworks of the state have to be repaired while they act, and a wheel has to be exchanged for another during its revolutions. Accordingly, props must be sought for to support society to keep it going while it is made independent of the natural condition from which it is sought to emancipate it. This prop is not found in the natural character of man, who, being selfish and violent, directs his energies rather to the destruction than to the preservation of society, nor is it found in his moral character, which has to be formed, which can never be worked upon or calculated on by the lawgiver, because it is free and never appears. It would seem, therefore, that another measure must be adopted. It would seem that the physical character of the arbitrary must be separated from moral freedom, that it is incumbent to make the former harmonize with the laws and the latter dependent on impressions. It would be expedient to remove the former still farther from matter and to bring the latter somewhat more near to it. In short, to produce a third character related to both the others, the physical and the moral, paving the way to a transition from the sway of mere force to that of law, without preventing the proper development of the moral character, but serving rather as a pledge in the sensuous sphere of our morality in the unseen. Thus, much is certain. It is only when a third character, as previously suggested, has preponderance that a revolution in a state according to moral principles can be free from injurious consequences, nor can anything else secure its endurance. In proposing or setting up a moral state, the moral law is relied upon as a real power, and free will is drawn into the realm of causes where all hangs together mutually with stringent necessity and rigidity. But we know that the condition of the human will always remains contingent, and that only in the absolute being physical coexists with moral necessity. Accordingly, if it is wished to depend on the moral conduct of man as on natural results, this conduct must become nature and he must be led by natural impulse to such a course of action as can only and invariably have moral results. But the will of man is perfectly free between inclination and duty, and no physical necessity ought to enter as a sharer in this magisterial personality. If, therefore, he is to retain his power of solution, and yet become 
a reliable link in the casual concatenation of forces. This can only be affected when the operations of both these impulses are presented quite equally in the world of appearances. It is only possible when, with every difference of form, the matter of man's volition remains the same, when all his impulses agree with his reason are sufficient to have the value of universal legislation. It may be urged that every individual man carries within himself, at least in his adaptation and destination, a purely ideal man. The great problem of his existence is to bring all the incessant changes of his outer life into conformity with the unchanging unity of this ideal. This pure ideal man, which makes itself known more or less clearly in every subject, is represented by the state, which is the objective and, so to speak, canonical form in which the manifold differences of the subjects strive to unite. Now, two ways present themselves to the thought in which the man of time can agree with the man of idea, and there are also two ways in which the state can maintain itself in individuals. One of these ways is when the pure ideal man subdues the empirical man and the state suppresses the individual, or again, when the individual becomes a state and the man of time is ennobled to the man of idea. I admit that, in a one-sided estimate, from the point of view of morality, this difference vanishes, for the reason is satisfied if her law prevails unconditionally. But when the survey taken is complete and embraces the whole man, anthropology, where the form is considered together with the substance, and the living feeling has a voice, the difference will become far more evident. No doubt the reason demands unity and nature variety in both legislations take man in hand. The law of the former is stamped upon him by an incorruptible consciousness, that of the latter by an ineradicable feeling. Consequently, education will always appear deficient when the moral feeling can only be maintained with the sacrifice of what is natural. And a political administration will always be very imperfect when it is only able to bring about unity by suppressing variety. The state ought not only to respect the objective and generic, but also the subjective and specific in individuals. And while diffusing the unseen world of morals, it must not depopulate the kingdom of appearance, the external world of matter. When the mechanical artist places his hand on the formless block to give it a form according to his intention, he has not any scruples in doing violence to it, for the nature on which he works does not deserve any respect in itself, and he does not value the whole for its parts, but the parts on account of the whole. When the child of the fine arts sets his hand to the same block, he has no scruples either in doing violence to it. He only avoids showing this violence. He does not respect the matter in which he works any more than the mechanical artist. What he seeks, by an apparent consideration for it, to deceive the eye which takes this matter under its protection. The political and educating artist follows a very different course, while making man at once his material and his end. In this case, the aim or end meets in the material, and it is only because the whole serves the parts that the parts adapt themselves to the end. The political artist has to treat his material, man, with a very different kind of respect than that shown by the artist of fine art to his work. He must spare man's peculiarity and personality not to produce a defective effect on the senses, but objectively and out of consideration for his inner being. But the state is an organization which fashions itself through itself and for itself, and for this reason 
it can only be realized when the parts have been accorded to the idea of the whole. The state serves the purpose of a representative, both to pure ideal and to objective humanity and the rest of its citizens. Accordingly, it will have to observe the same relation to its citizens in which they are placed to it, and it will only respect their subjective humanity in the same degree that it is ennobled to an objective existence. If the internal man is one with himself, he will be able to rescue his peculiarity even in the greatest generalization of his conduct, and the state will only become the exponent of his fine instinct, the clear formula of his internal legislation. But if the subjective man is in conflict with the objective, it contradicts him in the character of a people, so that only the oppression of the former can give victory to the latter, then the state will take up the severe aspect of the law against the citizen. And in order not to fall a sacrifice, it will have to crush underfoot such a hostile individuality without any compromise. Now man can be opposed to himself in a twofold manner, either as a savage when his feelings rule over his principles, or as a barbarian when his principles destroy his feelings. The savage despises art and acknowledges nature as his despotic ruler. The barbarian laughs at nature and dishonors it, but he often proceeds in a more contemptible way than the savage to be the slave of his senses. The cultivated man makes of nature his friend and honors its friendship while only bridling its caprice. Consequently, when reason brings her moral unity into physical society, she must not injure the manifold in nature. When nature strives to maintain her manifold character in the moral structure of society, this must not create any breach in moral unity. The victorious form is equally remote from uniformity and confusion. Therefore, totality of character must be found in the people which is capable and worthy to exchange the state of necessity for that of freedom.